I can say, and, and I say this from the bottom of my heart, uh, like I said, about mid-November, we'll, we'll have been here officially as the pastor for a year. Uh, but I had the privilege for about six months uh, to be the interim uh, there from about May on. So uh, really been here about a year and a half. And uh, I honestly really don't know what to say. Um, this has been the, probably, well, not even probably, this has been the most amazing year, year and a half of my ministry uh, that the Lord has blessed me with. Um, I have thoroughly enjoyed and appreciated the opportunities that God has given me everywhere that I've been uh, and that he's called me to. Uh, but this has been just uh, incredible uh, to come into a situation uh, behind Brother Jerry who established such a tremendous uh, foundation uh, for over 30 years and then to come in uh, with that knowing that that legacy is there and, and, and knowing uh, that as I told uh, I think I said this to the deacons the first time I met with the deacons that I was no fool uh, that this, this uh, facility this church the ministries of this church uh, breathed and sweated Brother Jerry <laughs> for all the time that he had spent here and but to come into that kind of a situation and yet feel the kind of love and appreciation and the openness and the encouragement uh, that has been a part of the year and a half that I have been here has been just absolutely overwhelming uh, and I cannot thank you enough uh, for the love that you have shown me and Sabrina and Aaron and and just the amount of time that I've uh, no longer that I've been here as best I can trying to get to know folks and 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 learn about the families learn about the ministries and those kind of things uh, the welcome that you've given us and the support that you've given us uh, it has been absolutely phenomenal uh, I, t uh, I tell people all the time uh, at work and everywhere else we'll be talking about the church or whatever and, and I tell them I said uh, the truth of the matter is I said if the church wasn't so good to help and to with the support structures that are here and all the things that are going on there's no way that I could do uh, this ministry and be a part of this but you guys as challenging it is, as it is, and I wouldn't change a thing, I love every minute of it, but as challenging as it is, you guys have made it such a blessing, and in many respects, so much easier than I would have ever thought. Uh, it, I, you know, I went into this thing, and I was scared to death, and, but you guys really have made this incredibly comfortable, uh, and, you know, it took absolutely no time at all to get to uh, develop good relationships with the leadership of the church and the uh, all, and, and all of the aspects of the leadership of the church and the support that's been here. Like I said a few weeks ago when I went on vacation, you have no idea as a pastor how wonderful it is and how comforting it is to be able to go on vacation and say, hey, can you fill in on this day and can you fill in on this day and can you do this on this day and be able to go and not worry about anything. I mean, that is absolutely the most incredible feeling that there is um, as a pastor. And, and so I thank you uh, for your love and your dedication to this church, the ministries of this church, and for the love that you've shown us. Uh, it truly is, I've said this many, many times, and I'll say it uh, forever, it is truly my privilege to minister alongside you guys. We love you, and we thank you for everything that you do. All right? Before we get into the message, I do want to say one other thing. Uh, those of you uh, deacons, uh, there's a rough draft of a letter sitting in there in Miss Tammy's office on the file cabinet, on one of the file cabinets in there, the, uh, the low file cabinets. If you don't care, uh, before you go home sometime today, pick that letter up. We'll be talking about it in the deacons meeting tomorrow night, okay? Uh, so grab you that. I've had it for two or three weeks, but everybody's been on vacation. <laughs> so we'll just go ahead and, if you don't care to pick that up before you go home either today or tonight, 
and then that way we can uh, kind of hit the ground running on this topic in the deacons meeting tomorrow evening all right if you have your bibles turn with me to ephesians chapter number six as we continue our study on be sober be vigilant understanding and overcoming the adversary ephesians chapter number six and we'll start reading in verse number 10 Ephesians chapter number 6, verse number 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand." Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breast plate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints." And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Let's pray. My Heavenly Father, once again we come to you and just thank you so much for the privilege that we had this morning of baptizing yet another believer in baptism. Father, that's the first real step of obedience for a, 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 a new child of God. And Father, once again, I pray that you would help uh, Sister Gary Kay to grow and mature and be the Christian that you would have her to be all the days of her life. Father, what a blessing it is that uh, you call from the youngest to the oldest. And we thank you for the privilege of being just a little bit a part of what you've done in their lives. Now, Father, I pray that you would just hide me behind Calvary, allow me to share the truth of the Word of God that you've burdened my heart with tonight or today, and we'll give you the praise for all that you do. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week, we moved from a more defensive view of our warfare with Satan to a more offensive one. And to do that, we have to have a good and have to have an accurate understanding of who our enemy is. And as we studied the first couple of chapters of the book of Job last week, we saw, first of all, that Satan is intelligent, but he's not omniscient. He doesn't know everything. Satan is organized, but he's not omnipresent. He can't be everywhere all the time. And we saw that Satan is powerful, but he's not omnipotent. In other words, he doesn't have all power. But how can we use that knowledge to help us stand against the attacks of Satan? And the answer to that question is in another verse that we looked at in that study. And that's James chapter 4 and verse number 7 that says, Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. The key to resisting the devil this enemy who's intelligent and organized and powerful is to submit to the one who does know all, who is everywhere and who is all powerful. Satan is limited, but God is not. The only way that we can defeat Satan is by relying on the knowledge and the presence and the strength of God. We cannot do it on our own, but we don't have to. As the Bible tells us in 1 John chapter number 4 and verse number 4, Ye are of God little children and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. But what does that submission, while still being on the offensive, actually look like? And that's what we're going to begin looking at today. And the best place to start is, is in what is arguably the most familiar passage of Scripture, 
when it comes to this idea or this concept of spiritual warfare. And that's Ephesians chapter number 6, verses 10 through 20. Now, the truth is, we could spend years studying just these 11 verses and so that we could rightly apply the passage to our lives. As a matter of fact, and I brought this with me today just to show you this, I have, this is William Gurnall's book, The Christian in Complete Armor, which is, as far as I'm concerned, the textbook and commentary on this passage. This book, in this format, is 1,189 pages of two-column small print. It was preached over the course of three years in 1662 to 1665. That's how far this dates. If you ever tell me I'm long-winded, <laughs> I'm going to hand you this book. So anything that I share as we look at this passage is going to literally be just a drop in the bucket compared to what I could share. I tell you all the time, the biggest struggle that I have is with what, how much to cover. And what to leave out, whether it's on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, whatever it happens to be. And for this, it's even been doubly difficult because in 2019, very early in the year, we're going to begin a series on the book of Ephesians. So, you know, what do I cover now and what do I leave for that bigger series? And all of those kind of things have been going through my mind. But I really think that I've kind of come to the place of what God would have for this particular study, and it's what I want to begin sharing with you today. When you look at these 11 verses, we really see three key thoughts. Number one, we see that we're to rely on our strength in Ephesians 6, verses 10 and 11. We see that we're to understand the opposition in verse number 12. And then we see that we're to prepare for battle in Ephesians 6, verses 13 through 20. And if you'll notice, those first two points of relying on our strength and understanding the opposition are actually connected to the thoughts that we had last week in that message where we saw that we're to recognize the strength and weaknesses of our enemy and we're to submit to God in order to resist Satan and his wiles and his devices. I'd never really seen that connection until I was studying for this particular series, but it really is there. So let's begin by looking at the first command that we see in verses 10 and 11 where it tells us that we're to rely on our strength. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now, in those two verses, we see the answer to how we're to engage in spiritual warfare. We see, number one, what we are to do. We see how we're to do it. And we also see why we're to do it. What are we to do? Well, verse 10 tells us, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Now, the first thing that we see here and we have to understand is that our strength is truly not our strength. This verse makes it abundantly clear, especially in the Greek, that what it's telling us is, is that we must allow the Lord to be our strength. It doesn't say that we need to be strong in our testimony about the Lord. It doesn't say that we need to be strong in our commitment to the Lord. It doesn't tell us that we need to be strong in our stand for the Lord. While all of those things are important, what this verse tells us without any question is that if we're to stand against Satan and his wiles and his devices, we have to rely on the strength of Christ in order to do that. The phrase, be strong, is actually better translated from the Greek as be strengthened or be empowered in the Lord. In other words, he is the source of our strength and it is his strength 
that needs to fill us. And that's what the rest of this verse actually tells us. We're to be strengthened in the Lord and in the great power that is found in Him. As we've said again, as we talked about even just a few minutes ago, we've said it so many times. It's not about us. It's all about Him. And that's especially true when it comes to spiritual warfare. So the question is, how do we allow this transfer of the power of Christ to happen so that we can be strong in Him? And the answer is actually found there in the first part of verse number 11. Put on the whole armor of God. Now again, this is extremely important. It is Christ that fills us with His strength. But for that to happen, we have to do something. We must, without any hesitation, put on the whole armor of God. So here it is in two steps. I choose to put on the whole armor. That's my part. And when I do that, Christ strengthens me through the components that are found in the armor itself. Truth, righteousness, the preparation of the gospel of peace, faith, salvation, the Word of God, and prayer. But here's the, impar- the important part. If you don't get anything else out of this message today, get this. It is the whole armor of God, not just individual pieces. You get this. You cannot go into battle with Satan half-dressed. You get that? You cannot go into battle with Satan half-dressed. Each component or piece of the armor provides a critical and strategic and important element of the strength that Christ provides and that we need in order to withstand Satan. To neglect one piece of this armor is to rob yourself of some of the strength that Christ and only Christ can provide. And we cannot defeat our adversary if we're not relying completely on all the strength that Christ provides. And that helps us to answer the question, why? Well, the rest of the verse 11 tells us that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Four times in verses 11 through 14, and if you'll remember when we talked about how to study the Bible in our Wednesday night series there, I told you, when you're reading a passage of Scripture and you see the same word over and over and over again, you better pay attention to it and you need to look at it and see what it means and try to understand why that seems to be such an important thing. And in verses 11 through 14, we see the word stand, and one time it's just a different variant of the word withstand, but you see that word or that idea of standing Four times. And it's always based on the same Greek word. It is, not surprisingly, given you're talking about an armor and all of those kind of things. It's a military term. And what it literally means is stand your ground. Okay? Not just stand up, but stand your ground. In other words, the strength of Christ provided through the right application of the armor that he provides, will allow us to not be driven back by the onslaughts of Satan, no matter how strong, no matter how cunning, or no matter how deceptive they are. Why? Because I'm not standing in my strength. I'm standing in Christ's strength. And greater is he that's within me than he that's within the world. So what are we standing against? Well, the word there is wiles. And it simply means the methods or the ways that Satan will attack us. And it means, when you think about it, the word method means that there's a plan attached to it. It's not just random. It's not just willy-nilly. It's not just kind of a spur of the moment. Well, let's see if this does something. There's a plan to the way that Satan attacks. And we've discussed earlier in our study from a big picture way that the attacks always involve in some sense or another the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, or the pride of life. 
But last week when we looked at Satan's attacks on Job, we also saw that Satan attacks, Satan's attacks are also specific to the strengths and the weaknesses of each believer. Satan went straight for the jugular uh, on Job by attacking what he feared most. Remember what Job said in, in chapter number 3 and verse 25, For the thing which I greatly feared is come upon me, and that which I was, I was afraid of is come unto me. Satan knew that it would be a much harder attack to go after Job's character. So instead, he didn't go after his strength. He went after his weaknesses, the things that he feared, the things that he was concerned about. And when you study the book of Job, you'll see that Job feared losing his standing in the community, losing his place as the one that people came to for advice and help and for being considered a man blessed by God. And that's what, that's what Job feared. And because of that, that's what, Job, that's what Satan went after when he attacked Job. But sometimes, as we talked about, he also goes after our strengths when that strength is actually a source of pride. A great example of that is Peter. In Matthew chapter number 26, verses 31 through 35, we read these familiar words. Then Jesus saith unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. But after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. Peter answered, love Peter. Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, that this night before the cock crow, Thou shalt deny me thrice. Peter said unto him, Though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. Likewise also said all the disciples. Satan went for what Peter thought was his greatest strength. And that was his commitment to Christ. And we know how that played out. And here's the thing. He has a specific strategy for you as well. Yeah, the main pathways are the same. The lust of the, uh, the flesh, the lust of the eye, the pride of life. But he knows where your strengths and he knows where your weaknesses are. And he'll use them to try and defeat you. And that's why we must put on the whole armor of God. And then we go to verse number 12, and we see that the wiles of Satan involve more than just his own personal activities, which is why we need to understand the opposition. Look at it again in verse number 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. As we noted in the last message from the life of Job, we know that Satan is powerful, but he is limited. He doesn't know everything, and he can't do anything without God's permissive will, and he can't be in more than one place at a time. So to compensate for that, he's created an entire hierarchy of fallen angels or demons to make up for his limits. Now you get this. In Revelation chapter number 5 and verse number 11, we read this. And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders. And the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. Now this is a scene in heaven after the rapture of the church in Revelation chapter number 5. And the largest number... That's part of the Greek vocabulary and a part of the Greek numbering system was 100 million, okay? And that's 10,000 times 10,000. That's 100 million. And what John says is, is that there were thousands and thousands of angels above the highest number that you could even count in Greek. What J John was basically saying is, is that the number of angels are limitless, Beyond even counting. But then in Revelation chapter 12, 
verses 3 and 4. We read about the fall of Satan at the beginning, before his temptation of Adam and Eve. And we read about his fall and about those who followed him in that rebellion. It says, And there appeared another wonder in heaven. And behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. But did you catch that little bit? And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven. Talking about the angels. One third of the angels of heaven followed Satan in his rebellion. And even after the defection of that one-third, the angels in heaven are still beyond counting. But that also tells us something else. The number of demonic beings must nearly be without number as well. And just as they followed Satan in his revolt against God, they follow him now in his ongoing rebellion. And the way that Satan manages this host of demons, this innumerable number of fallen angels, the way that he manages that is by creating a hierarchy. Basically a command and execution strategy that allows him to deceive people into hell, persecute the saints, and cause believers to stumble in their walk with God. From this verse, we see that there are some who are responsible for territories or countries or regions or something similar. That's the meaning of the word principalities and what it's talking about when it talks about the rulers of the darkness of this world. In Ephesians chapter number 1, it also uses the word dominion to describe that same kind of thing. This hierarchy that are a part of the command structure. We saw that last time when we read that passage out of Daniel where the angel said he had to fight with the prince of Persia before he could get to Daniel. This prince, this angel, this fallen angel that had responsibility for this kingdom or this region or this area of Persia. These, this hierarchy, this command structure are overseers making sure that Satan's designs are carried out. Then we read about the powers and the spiritual wickedness in high places. And that's more the execution arm uh, of the hierarchy, the foot soldiers, if you will. Those who are tasked with putting into action the strategy that Satan devises. It's this group of spiritual soldiers that provide intelligence and feedback to those in command so that adjustments can be made or particular strategies be put into place so that he knows what your strengths and your weaknesses are. And all of this great multitude of demons works together to do collectively what Satan cannot do on his own. It allows him to have eyes and ears everywhere. It allows him to work as if he can see everything and be everywhere despite his limitations. Isn't it amazing that it always seems like the devil knows exactly how to attack you? He can't be everywhere. He can't see everything. But he's got enough of them running around that they know and they can tell him and that's exactly what happens. And that's what we see here. And the Bible says, and you get this, the Bible says that the provision of the armor of God is the only way to overcome Satan and this powerful hierarchy. And the reason that we need this armor is because we're not fighting against flesh and blood. If, we're, if it were merely a matter of fighting against people, we might be able to do it in our own strength. We might be able to do it in our own wisdom. We might be able to do it in our own power. But there are greater things in play. And because of that, we have to stand. We must stand in the whole armor of God. And that's the only way that we can be strengthened in the Lord to fight the battle. Now, In the next message in this series, we're going to be studying the different pieces of armor that provides the strength of Christ that we need in order to fight Satan. 
Each is an important element, as we've said, because we cannot go half-dressed as we battle the adversary. But let me ask you a question this morning. You may be in a battle right now, but you know ultimately that you're trying to fight that battle in your own strength. You're trying to do it on your own. It may be an attack of the mind. And it may demonstrate its way in being frustrated with circumstances. It may demonstrate its way in being angry. It may demonstrate its way in being depressed and and, and tied down and seemingly overwhelmed. You're fighting a battle. And you're doing everything you can in your own strength to overcome it. You may be going to the doctors and, hey, you will never, ever, ever hear me say, you don't need to go to the doctor. So don't even say that. Okay? I'm a firm believer in the advances of medicine and all of those kind of things. But can I tell you something? Sometimes you just got to rely on Jesus. Take the medicine. But use it as a part of what Christ is using to give you strength. It's not the answer. It's just a help. You may, you know, you know, I've read and I do a lot of reading, as you all know. And, you know, you read all of these kind of things about how to relax and how to do all of those kind of things. And, and again, I'm not against them if they work. I read something today. It said that there's an army method that helps soldiers fall to sleep quickly even on the battlefield when things are going on around them. And I read it and it kind of made a little bit of sense. So if you're just having trouble sleeping or going to sleep, that might be a great thing to do. But can I tell you something? The greatest peace you'll ever have on a battlefield is knowing that you're relying on Jesus to fight your battle through you. So you may be fighting a battle this morning. It may be physical. It may be mental. It may be spiritual. And it may be a physical battle that the devil is using to attack you mentally and spiritually. It could be any number of things. But can I tell you this? If you try to fight it in your own strength, you're going to go down. I'm not being mean, and I'm not being smart aleck or cocky. I'm just telling you, if the devil's fighting you, the only way you're going to be able to stand, and that word stand means to stand your ground, is to rely on the strength that Christ provides. So do you need to come this morning and ask him to be your strength? Submit yourself unto God. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. The first key is submitting to him because you realize you can't do it on your own. As we stand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, Brother Wallace comes to play softly. Father, (laughs) I've shared.